Uh, my name is Floyd Müller from the Exertion Games Lab. We are lab, Fitz the lab coach. Um, together with my co-authors, we are presenting designing for bodily interplay in social exertion games. Uh, we in the lab, we work with the um, uh, realization that we used to play with digital, uh, uh, we're coming from playing with digital content, to now, thanks to sensor advances, to play with digital using our bodies. But what we really want is experiencing our bodies as digital play. In order to make this vision a reality, I now present you like a small subset of that vision. And that is concerned with how bodies interplay with one another. They already do that. If you play a Kinect game, you have two bodies engaging in one common game goal. Um, similar, if you use your Fitbit to go jogging, you also engage with two bodies in some kind of play because you can compete with one another, whoever gets their step count up the highest, and that's competition, that's for us a form of play. Or Pokemon Go, you have two bodies engaging in some kind of digital play experience. But what we argue is that in um, these three experiences, they rather play, these bodies play in parallel. And what we argue here is that this is only such a small subset of the bodily interplay experiences that we as humans are capable of. And instead, there's a larger design space of what we can actually do and support as designers. And this talk is about kind of expanding your horizon to what we currently do, to what is actually possible. And to understand what's possible, we argue that it might be useful to look at sports. In particular, we look at things such as boxing, right, where people don't really play in parallel, but rather they act um, um, with one another and on each other. Similar if you take wrestling, they act with one another and on one another, in particular on another's body. But this is not necessarily only um, restricted to um, full contact sports. In tennis, you also act on and uh, you also act with and on the other person. And here you do that through the tennis ball, and that's an interesting um, aspect to these bodily interplay experiences that I come back to later. So in order to understand that, we propose this concept of bodily interplay. Bodily interplay is a dimension, i.e. it has um, it's, it's, a, it's a range, and it um, starts from parallel exertion, where you act uh, independently from another towards a shared goal. Um, for example, um, uh, a jogging is parallel play, or a 100 meter race is parallel exertion play, and on the other hand, you have interdependent exertion. For example, uh, boxing, or brawl, or wrestling. Um, well, let me just uh, quickly demonstrate that. Let me just get you to stand up here for one second. So this is parallel play now, right? So if we have a 100-meter race, right, and we just pretend you're running a 100-meter race, you're running a 100-meter race, and that's parallel play, right? Because I'm not allowed, and it's, it, this is based on like mostly unwritten rules, but sometimes you have written rules in terms of like a line, right? I'm not allowed to interfere with the other person, right? I can't push him out of the way to win the 100-meter race. That wouldn't be allowed. Of course, I could like, you know, yell, and you know, try to intimidate my, uh, uh, my 100 meter competitor, but this is not on a bodily level. On a bodily level, I'm not allowed. However, if we start a brawl, right, and you can already tell the difference in a brawl, like you kind of you face each other, right? In parallel exertion, you kind of face the same direction, but if you go to a wrestling game, back for a second, <laughs> right? We face each other, and that is important because it allows us to do different kind of user experiences. Thank you. Um, and that's what we had in the previous talk, right? When people were blocking each other, that's inter, um, uh, uh, interdependent exertion. Because it allows you to play offensively and defensively. Right? I can try to prevent the other person from achieving his or her goal. I could prevent you from becoming the winner in the wrestling game. It wouldn't really make sense to be uh, to play uh, defensively in a 100 meter race. Right? It wouldn't be worth it. The other thing is, um, also, I can get, get you up again for a second. If, if we run a 100 meter race, right, and I do what I just did, I go home, you might still enjoy the 100 meter race. In a game of wrestling, if I give up and go, it wouldn't be wrestling <coughs> for that person anymore. Right, so the interplay is a very different one. Thank you. That's all. Thank you.
<laughs> you can see the stress in your eye, what kind of rest here? Oh, good. So, um, so now that we understand more the interplay, we basically argue that we know this from sports in the physical space, but now we can also look at it in the virtual space. And I know that you know, not with everything you can easily differentiate between physical and virtual space, but for the purpose of this talk, we focus on these because we find that in most cases, uh, most design cases, this is actually uh, the case. Um, and we argue that in the virtual space, we can also differentiate between parallel and interdependent exertion. And um, now, if you see, look at this dimension, you see this really nice two by two design space. And we argue that's really interesting, in particular, um, we can now fill up these four spots, and we start with parallel in the physical space and parallel in the virtual space. And we say here is an opportunity to extend existing sports. In particular, we do this already. If you have ever watched a 100 meter race, like you know, the Olympics or a, uh, or a championship, and the competitors are really, really close to one another. And so it's so close to another that you can't see with your bare eyes who actually won. Well, then we already extend that into the virtual space with like a, um, high speed cameras in order to allow us to have a more fine grained competition than without the virtual space. So we already map that from the physical. Uh, into the virtual space with parallel experiences. We argue now we can do the same thing with interdependent exertion in the physical and in the virtual space. But the most interesting things are these where you kind of mix and match parallel and interdependent exertion. And these are really novel opportunities that opportunities that we propose or might be really interesting for you to explore if you are a designer. So I'm going to show you now a couple of case studies to populate the design space. And I understand some of them uh, are a bit older, but we decided to include them anyhow because we're going to show you how these um, bodily interplay dimension evolved from our design practice, and then we refined it and refined our designs based on that. And from there, we went to um, the uh, theory again. So this massive, me a messy design proce process of going from theory to design to theory to design. And um, so in jogging over distance, we want to support parallel exertion, right? What we demonstrated here, um, jogging is parallel because you're facing um, uh, the same direction. Um, but we want to support that even if they are in two different locations. So what I want you to pay attention now in the video that I'm going to show you is how we realize the parallel character of jogging in the virtual space in order to support these joggers. And what kind of representations we use to make that a reality. Let me show you a video here. Jogging over a distance. Jogging over a distance allows joggers in different locations to jog together. They can profit from similar benefits as in jogging side by side, such as social interaction, motivational support and increased fitness. We use spatialised sound delivered over headphones to convey a sense of how fast your partner is running, similar to jogging side by side. If you are running faster than your partner, she or he Here's your voice coming from the front, and if your partner is speeding up, you can hear your partner coming, because the sound comes closer, eventually overtaking you. We measure both joggers' speed and wirelessly transmit it to a spatialization algorithm that positions the sound on a virtual 2D plane around the jogger's head. Jogging over a distance is not meant to replace jogging side by side, but might be the next best thing if you cannot find a suitable jogging partner or to stay in touch with jogging friends that moved away. You can chat away while getting some exercise, and through pace awareness, you can motivate one another to go that extra mile. Thanks for watching Jogging Over a Distance. So now, before going back to the design space, as promised, I quickly want to divert to representations that I'm sure most of you know, but just in case uh, I repeat, uh, some of the prior work about representations, and I know some of the work has been concerned with like going beyond representations, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to stick with that, um, because again, we found it very useful for our design practice to at least start off from. We start with the, with the ones at the bottom, because we find them often the most easy ones to implement. <coughs> These are symbolic representations. For example, if I want to represent insertion, I can just have a simple LED that shows me red, the other person is not exerting green, the other person is exerting. Right? Really easy to implement, but requires some kind of cultural knowledge that green means yes or go, red means no or stop. 
You can also use indexical, represent uh, indexical representations, so that's a kind of conceptually a bit buff there, because they kind of represent space and time in terms of insertion. For example, like you saw with a two-dimensional volume space around your head. And they often really nicely match to the space-time characteristic of insertion because the body moves in space and time. Or you can use iconic representations. These are representations that resemble the exerting body. Most common example is like an avatar. So now that we know these three types of representations, we can go back to the design space that I showed you earlier and um, kind of analyze jogging over distance. Right? And uh, we argue that there's three key aspects to parallel exertion in the virtual space. And the first one is knowing, the next one is comparing exertion, and then matching exertion. And if you have these three key characteristics, you can see that we could have just implemented a symbolic representation where we show you that another person is jogging. And that's all you get through this little LED red or green. And that is important because we know from sports science that simply knowing that somebody else is exerting can be motivated, I call it like peer pressure, and sorry, uh, frame it. But you might also want to support the co being able to compare exertion. And for that, we recommend you use indexical representations, like we've done with a specialized audio. Um, this is the, uh, the third one, it's about matching exertion. We haven't implemented that, but our participants have certainly talked about it, of, uh, talked about using jogging over distance as a way um, to train, as a training tool because you wanted to use it to train um, improving stride. And if you want to use that to improve stride, we recommend you use a, an iconic representation, like an avatar that shows you actually stride. So here you hopefully saw that we use the design space to analyze an existing system in the parallel world, and now we're going to talk about interdependent exertion in the virtual space. And for that, I show you a table tennis for three. So table tennis for three, the aim is to support uh, three players in three different locations. So it's parallel in the physical world, because obviously they can't interfere with each, with each other because they're different locations. But we wanted to keep the interdependent aspect that we know from table tennis. So in that video now, I encourage you to look at how we represented that in the virtual world in order to keep that interdependent aspect um, that we know and love from table tennis. Hi. And welcome to Table Tennis for Three. Table Tennis for Three allows players to play table tennis together, although they can be anywhere in the world. And what's more, three players can play at the same time. Nobody has to wait until it's their turn. The players use a regular ball and bat on a table tennis table that has one side flipped up. The video conference of the other two players is projected onto the flipped up side, which has been painted white. Each player has a ball with which to hit virtual targets projected on top of the video conference. There are eight targets, and each hit damages a target a bit more. Three hits destroy a target, and only the player who actually makes it disappear gets the point. All three players see all eight targets, and once a target is hit, they all see it. So the players are always on the lookout for the targets that are already been hit twice by the others. This design reflects the idea of my actions depend on your actions from traditional table tennis, because each player has to watch what the other player is doing in order to snatch the point just before one of the opponents hits the target for the third and final time. The player with the most points wins the game. experience bodily inter interplay uh, on an interdependent level. And these were these blocks that players had to hit, right? And for that, we used an indexical representation because it was important for you as a player to know that the other player, let's for example, hit like, you know, the upper right hand block twice in order to allow you to hit it now for the third and final time to snatch the point away. And that is exactly what I talked about in the beginning about um, tennis, right? So tennis, this is your shared object that allows you to have interdependent play, and we can now represent that in the virtual world. You can also use a shared space, which I'm going to skip for the purpose of this presentation, and go directly to a shared body. Because this allows me to introduce you to remote impact, 
which is a boxing game that again allows players in two separate locations, so parallel in the physical world, but to act on the same body, or each other's body, to be more precise, in the virtual world. And again, I encourage you to think about how, as a designer, you would implement that representation and be used in the design space um, to derive um, suggestions for that. So this is Remote Impact. Hi, and welcome to Remote Impact, shadow boxing over a distance. Remote Impact allows two players in different locations to shadow box one another, inspired by full body contact sports to promote stress relief, weight loss, and general fitness. The game encourages extreme physical exertion, and unlike the Nintendo Wii and other console games, it recognizes and registers intense move force. <laughs> Traditional contact sports, such as football, rugby, and martial arts, are well known for their effectiveness in social bonding and team building. Remote Impact offers these benefits to participants who live in different places. The shadow of the remote participant is projected onto the interface, along with your own shadow. The goal is to punch and kick the remote person's shadow, but be careful not to get hit yourself. So you have to dodge it by ducking or moving out of the way, just as in real sports. <laughs> <laughs> so this is remote impact, and here you can hopefully see that we use an iconic representation in order to enable interdependent play in the virtual space. So I've shown you a couple of examples now where we use the modeling interplay that I mentioned to analyze existing systems. So that every time they are hit, you project like a big paw sign uh, onto their body. Or you might actually move this down here to think about how do we support parallel uh, exertion in the virtual space. And that might, for example, give you the idea of what we call heart rate boxing, where the players both wear a heart rate monitor, they still box one another, but the winner is whoever gets up their heart rate up the highest. So that's a novel game we find. And then you again use, your, um, use the bodily interplay dimension to think about how you represent that. And you might realize you might not need an avatar, but maybe a dexical representation is enough because it's often more easy to implement. And then you use something like the 2D audio space that we showed you earlier as an easy to implement way to represent um, the heart rate, right? So high heart rate in front, low heart rate in the back. So to summarize, we introduce you to the idea of bodily interplay that you can you know, try out in the physical world and also apply to the previous talk we saw where people were blocking each other in order to play Pac-Man. Um, it consists of two dimensions. Both of them um, have two key aspects, which is parallel and interdependent play that's in the physical space as well as in the virtual space. And with this two-dimensional design space, you have two key areas. One is about extending existing sports, and the other ones are novel opportunities for you as digital game designer that encourage you to explore further. And with that, I conclude my talk on designing for bodily interplay in social exertion games. My name is Floyd Müller from the Exertion Games Lab. Thank you very much. for one.